You may or may not be aware that the 2021 NFL draft just happened over the past three days. Um, so many young men, you know, achieving their dream, reaching the, the culmination of all of their hard work uh, in high school sports and college sports. Uh, it was certainly a time of joy for some of those football players, uh, but also certainly a time of maybe sadness or disappointment for others who who didn't get in. But for a third group, I'm guessing it was a, a time of great stress. And that group is the teams that were responsible for choosing the best person. You know, they've got 200 young men to choose from from all over the country, really thousands of young men, but they can only choose 200, uh, maybe six or seven per team, and they need to choose what's best for their team. Sounds stressful to me. Sounds like a hard job. But what would make it a little easier is if you had some kind of tangible, outward, statistical, observable qualities that you could look for. You know, how fast can they run a 40? How fast can they run a mile? How far can they throw a ball? You know, all of these kind of observable statistics that we can see so that when our boss says, find me the very best football player, you have at least something you can look at. You can't just subjectively choose your favorite. You need to observe. And really, that's true in everything, right? You know, certainly that needs to be true about the most elite military squads, right? They need to choose the best based on real evidence. It's the same in the corporate world as bosses are assembling their staffs. Hopefully, it should be the same in our elections, right? Uh, who, who do you elect? The best-looking candidate? How do we handle the responsibility of voting for our presidents or our representatives? Well, we look at what can be observed. We look at their policies. We look at their character. We look at the evidence to help us make a decision, even a decision as momentous as electing our officials. Last week, we saw that Titus was left in Crete, and he was there manning his post to set things in order and to appoint godly elders. This week, we'll explore Paul's instruction to them about how to appoint elders. What do you look for? Do you just choose the best-looking men in the church? Do you just choose the oldest men in the church? You know, what do you look for? If you remember, near the very beginning of the New Testament church as a whole, uh, back in Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 6, um, they have this issue, and the, the apostles need some help with administration. Do you remember this story? They had some widows that were being overlooked. And so the apostles, they didn't have time to do this. They needed to keep teaching. They needed to keep praying for the church. And so they, they said, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Now, normally we think of those men as kind of the prototypical deacons, deacons before there were deacons, um, of, of how do you... How do you choose these men? Well, the apostle said, make sure they're men of good repute, make sure they're full of the spirit and full of wisdom. But how do you know that? Can you see into a man's heart? How do you know? Okay, maybe you can figure out if he's of good repute. But how do you know if he's full of wisdom? How do you know if he's full of the Holy Spirit? If he's walking in the spirit, walking in godliness, knowledgeable in the scriptures, how do you know? What are the outward signs that you can point to if you want to determine these things? Well, I think that the outward signs of this godly maturity is exactly what we find in our text today, in Titus chapter 1. I believe that he is saying, as a leader in that church, Titus was to appoint elders, along with the churches themselves, appointing elders, well, how do they know who to appoint? How do they know who the godly, mature men are in the church? Well, you need to look at something. You need to observe something. 
So in our text today, Paul gives Titus three areas of blamelessness for an elder. Three areas of blamelessness. As a congregation, how do we handle the responsibility, just like I said about voting? How do we handle this great responsibility of appointing our own elders? Of appointing who's going to lead the church, the church that Jesus died for? Well, I think we can focus on these three areas. Taking an objective look at something that might seem subjective at the beginning. But before we begin, let's cover a few ground rules, okay? (laughs) First, having objective criteria for examining elders does not give the congregation license to be nasty and rude to their elders, right? No. You know, perhaps you've been part of a church where the pastor and his family are just always under the microscope. It's like the congregation is just waiting for something to go wrong. They examine every single little detail of their life, and they become the center of attention for the church's gossip club. And before you know it, that gossip explodes into a coup, you know, explodes into slander and rudeness. Churches can be so quick to forget the commands to love each other. So that's ground rule number one. Another one, all of these objective criteria are still a little bit subjective. What do I mean by that? Well, one of them, for example, is that an elder should be hospitable. Well, how hospitable? You know, is, is he, oh, I remember 10 years ago, I went to his house. Or does it need to be this year? Or does it need to be monthly? You know, it's, it's kind of a something subjective, even though we're calling these objective criteria for looking and how to examine men to see if they're qualified to be elders. Even the objective criteria are somewhat subjective, and I think we need to treat it like that and remember that. Not pretend like, It's all black and white, my way or the highway. Pastor hasn't had me over in three months. He's out of here, right? (laughs) You know? I just, I've, I've seen that attitude in churches before. Third, ground rule. Remember that Paul writes, remember what Paul writes in 1 Timothy 5. He says, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Another ground rule for us to remember that Uh, If it's a serious charge that someone just stands up and shouts out against an elder, well, the church needs to slow down. Yes, take it seriously, but wait until there's more than one witness. And I think this is a protection against elders who are quick to be slandered. If, If an elder makes some decision that somebody in the church doesn't like, well, we've seen in church history that often what can happen is people make false accusations. They're trying to get that pastor out of there. They don't like the decisions that he's making. And so we're going to slander him. We're going to make a false accusation. And so he's protecting elders here. Now, I think the proper way for a minor issue to be addressed, if you have an issue with an elder, uh, is not get together a group of witnesses and, uh, and come together and dismiss the elder. I think minor issues, we're going to sin against each other in the church. Of course we are. We're going to need to forgive each other. Minor issues should be taken to that person and say, you know, do you realize you sinned against me when you did this? Um, Give a chance for repentance. But if it's a major issue, just remember to be careful. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Finally, last point before we begin is I just want to examine that word blameless. When I say three areas of blamelessness, That word for blameless is, is the word for bring a charge against or accuse with the prefix not in front of it. So you, you can't bring a charge against this person. You can't accuse him. They're blameless. They're upright in these areas. You know, it's often translated in modern translations as an elder is above reproach. You can't condemn their character. 
Now, there's another word for blameless in the New Testament that means truly perfect, totally unblemished in every way. Listen to this. This is Jude chapter 1, verse 24. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. And the verse goes on, but he's, he's speaking here of this total eschatological perfection. Totally perfect before God himself. That is not the word that is used about the elders. And praise God, right? Paul is not commanding that the elders are perfect men. There's no such thing. We wouldn't have any elders in any church. Elders are going to sin. Elders are going to need to be forgiven. Elders are going to make some wrong decisions. The congregation is going to need to be gracious sometimes and not just be quick to, to boot the elders out the door. Instead of perfection, when you observe these areas of blamelessness, you're looking for men who are commendable and upright. So now that we have all those ground rules set in place, let's get to our text. Paul gives three areas of blamelessness, family, character, and doctrine. Those are our three areas of blamelessness. Family, character, and doctrine. Follow along as I read Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Pray with me before we begin. Father, we feel the weight. We feel the importance of having godly order and structure in your church. We feel the weight and the importance of having godly men appointed as elders over your church. And so, Father, help us understand what Paul wrote to Titus, what your Holy Spirit inspired. Help us to understand the true meaning and intention of these words that we read. And Father, as we study them, I pray that these truths would be truths that lead to joy in this church body. Truths that lead to excitement. Truths that lead to an eagerness to love each other and obey your word instead of truths that lead to conflict in this body. Father, please spare us from that. Help us love each other. Help us be kind. Help us bow the knee before your word as people who accept what it says humbly rather than pretending we lord it over your word. Help us worship you alone and love our brothers and sisters in this church body. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first area of blamelessness is family. 
Family, an elder is to be a good manager in the home, displaying wise leadership that evidences itself in all kinds of ways. Verse 6, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. So, first, he is supposed to be the husband of one wife, or more woodenly, a one-woman man, is what it says. A one-woman man. And you can kind of think about what that means, right? He is to be a one-woman man. And so we open up our first can of worms in this verse, right? (laughs) This little phrase has caused so much tension in churches. You wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. If you haven't been party to a conflict like this, you'd be surprised at how much heat this little phrase can generate. Raised voices in the church, lost livelihoods in the church, maybe even raised fists in the church. People get angry about this verse because he doesn't use a word for divorce, and he could have. He doesn't use a word for polygamy, and he could have. He doesn't use a word that describes history, and he he could have. He just says, one woman man. That's what he says. And by the way, that's the exact language that the leadership has tr- preserved in the Constitution that we're working on. So what does the apostle mean? Well, we have several options, and it doesn't seem like it would matter that much which option we choose until it does matter until we find ourselves in the midst of a pastoral search or we find ourselves in the midst of an elder nomination. And so some will say that if there has ever been a divorce in that person's life, then he's disqualified. But then that brings up questions. Well, what about if that elder was left by an unbeliever? Doesn't the text say that he's free? What if the divorce happened while he was an unbeliever and now for 40 years he's been faithful to his spouse. Is he disqualified? Others will say that it's only speaking of polygamy, which frankly makes it pretty easy for us to obey in this country, right? That that almost disqualifies no one in our churches. Others say that this phrase must means that an elder must be married, so single men would be disqualified. That's the point. He's saying an elder needs to be a married man. And so unmarried men like Jesus and Paul, they wouldn't be able to be elders. Others say that a man can't have ever committed adultery in his whole life. But what about adultery of the heart? Committed as a young man, does that disqualify him forever? You see how many issues there are to deal with in this. These things come up And the decision is a hard one. So let's go back to the text and see what we can determine. Let's let the text speak for itself. He says, verse 6, If anyone is above reproach, a one-woman man. And I think that if we're taking this in its context, we can see that we can all agree that this is Paul saying that in his relationships with women, at least right now, in his relationships with women, This is a man who is above reproach. And so one woman man would certainly disqualify a polygamist, but this doesn't this term seems too broad to only be disqualifying polygamy. It's such a a broad term, a one woman man. And so I think we need to consider the main controlling idea of this verse is we're looking for godly, mature man. What does maturity look for? What does maturity look like um, in an elder? Someone who is not bringing shame on the church, someone who's blameless in this area. So would it include polygamy? Yes, I think so. Would it include divorce? Yes, I think so. 
Would it include adultery, even adultery of the heart? I would say yes. All of those things can be things that disqualify an elder. If a man is an elder in our church, we should be able to confidently trust. Listen to this. If a man is an elder, we should be able to confidently trust that he is above reproach in his faithfulness to his spouse and in his own thought life. Now, certainly in churches, that trust has been betrayed in the past. But I think the point is that we need to be able to trust these elders, that they are above reproach in their faithfulness and even in their own thought life. And I'm sure that almost all Christians would agree that that certainly means no recent divorces, no extra women in his life, no filthy images in his life, It certainly would mean those things. Where Christians would argue is how much does this verse speak of in terms of history, right? What if it's been 40 years of faithful marriage after a divorce? Is that man still qualified? These are the kind of issues that churches need to decide. And really, my position is that these things need to be a case-by-case basis. If the real question is, is the man's character above reproach as a believer, is the man's character above reproach, then it has to be a case-by-case decision. You're looking at a man. So what of the single man? If he has upright character... Is he disqualified because he's a man without one woman? I personally would think not. Again, I think that this is a character issue. This is speaking of the kind of man this man is. Paul even recommended that some men stay unmarried for the sake of ministry, not to hinder ministry. That's just one case study, and we could spend all morning all afternoon on on about a million other case studies that we could go into. You know, what if he was this? What if he was this? What if this was some time in his history? But I think we need to resort to the fact that this needs to be a case-by-case decision, that you're looking for somebody who is godly and upright, who is a one-woman man, But if you have any hesitations about this, please talk to the leadership about this. Don't hold your hesitations in. Don't become rude and become a gossip behind the scenes. Talk to the elders about this. We would love to discuss this with you. And... The issue is, back to to what I said at the beginning, how this causes so much conflict, I think that a lot of it is that people just aren't willing to have gracious conversations about this. There's a chance that the leadership of this church is probably even more strict than you are in their interpretation of these verses. So talk to them about it. Talk to them about what it would look like for a case-by-case basis, if there's something that's bothering you. Talk to the leaders. But let's move on to the children. And as we move on to the children, let's open up our second can of worms, all right? Um, another just area of such great conflict, church, su- churches splitting, people revolting, people leaving churches. Verse 6, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. This one is a can of worms because that phrase, having faithful children, is often translated as having believing children. And many of you probably have that in your translations. Having believing children, which would mean that an elder would be disqualified if any of his children are not yet a believer, not yet a Christian. In most of the modern translations, this is the, the route that they've begun to be, be, Again, to choose. 
but it hasn't always been so. And I think that the recent trend towards this interpretation of children are believers, I think that that trend has not been a, a good one. The issue is that the word for faithful in believing is the same word in Greek. At least the same root. The word for faithful children and the word for believing children would be the same word, the same root in Greek based on pistos. Usually if the root is given as a noun, it describes faith. But if it's given as an adjective, which it is here, it refers to faithfulness. In other words, if someone has pistos, they have faith. They're believers. If someone is pistos, then they are faithful. They're trustworthy. They're dependable. This second usage is is very common in Greek literature of Paul's day. Very frequently used of a faithful servant or faithful children, obedient, trustworthy, well-behaved children. And this is a sense that I think is being used in verse 6. Therefore, what disqualifies an elder is not whether his children, one of his children's, disbelieves. Now, listen to me on this. If over and over and over you see this elder is continually having no children who believe, well, that's at least a red flag, right? Or if these children have left the home and they say, I'm not a believer because I've seen how my dad has just lived like a dog, even though he's a pastor of a church. Well, again, huge red flag, right? But I believe that what he's saying here is not talking about the status of the children's salvation. Instead, it's if, it's if his children are, as the rest of the verse says, if they are open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. That's how he follows up this phrase. So if he has reckless, unmanaged children in his home, the children that raise eyebrows in the church, this is the kind of man that should not be an elder. You love him, and you help him become a better dad, and you help him grow in maturity, and maybe someday he can be an elder. But for right now, he's not managing his household well. And listen to the parallel on this. This is from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4. He says, speaking of an elder, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? And really, I think that's the point of the qualification here in Titus, is you're looking at this man's home because you're trying to gauge who is the man that's full of wisdom in the church, who is the man who is full of the Spirit, who's, who's orchestrating his home in a godly way. Will you look at his marriage? Is he faithful? Is he a one-woman man? Has he displayed that faithfulness for years? And you look at his children. Are they submissive? Are they obedient? Are they faithful and obedient and trustworthy? Really, this goes back to the heart of the entire list. How do you know if a man is mature? You look at his family. What is his character like? Is he faithful? Is he a good father? That's the first area of blamelessness. The second area of blamelessness is his conduct. His conduct, look at verse 7. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Last week we spoke about how overseer is a synonym for the word elder, and he uses that word here in verse 7, an overseer, describing specifically his oversight of the church. A synonym for elder, another word for an elder. And here we get another title for an overseer as God's steward. Steward, a a household manager. Have you ever heard this word before? A godly steward. Maybe somebody that a wealthy person could leave town for a while 
and just leave everything under this person's control, a steward. He's filling in for that person. And Nathan has told me before about how if you're a landlord, instead of having to do all of the plumbing and uh, repairs and things like that, you can hire a property management company that for a flat rate, you know, I, I forget what, like 70 bucks a month or something like that, you can, for a flat rate, you can have somebody who's in charge of all those decisions. So your tenants, they call that person instead of you. And they have authority over your money to fix the plumbing and fix other issues. That's like a steward. Maybe if you combined that modern day I- idea of a property manager with the modern, ide- modern day idea of a power of attorney able to make legal decisions for you and you combine that again with the modern day idea of a nanny able to make decisions about your children and even discipline your children, I think you get all of that wrapped up into a biblical steward. That's a steward of that day. is somebody who is your representative, somebody that you trust so much they are making decisions on behalf of you. That's a lot of responsibility in one man, right? He's saying that the elders, they need to be trusted in the same way. They need to be able to make honest and wise decisions. They are God's stewards. In a sense, God has left them in the church to make decisions and to lead on behalf of himself. Just like a steward. And so they need to be men who are very trustworthy. Again, that doesn't mean they're going to be perfect, right? They're going to mess up sometimes. But you can, you can tell the weight, again, of that office, God's steward. And so this leads into this list of qualities that we see in verse 7. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. We've got five negative qualities there that would disqualify an elder. An, an elder cannot be a prideful boaster. He can't be arrogant. Arrogance does not mix with somebody who's of upright character. Second, an elder should not have the reputation of being quick-tempered. You know, we know those in the church who, who have a short fuse. We know the hotheads in the church, and we love those people, and we're glad they're in the church, and we're patient with them, but those are not the people that you point to and say, that should be an elder. No, you wait until he grows, and he learns how to be slow to anger, until he grows in maturity. Third, an elder cannot be a drunkard, someone who is drinking to the point of intoxication. An elder can't be a violent man resorting to harsh words or physical violence to solve conflicts. There should be no violence in an elder. And fifth, an elder can't be a greedy man. Someone who's in the ministry for the money. Someone who is taking advantage of the flock so that he can feather his nest. Always looking for the next upgrade in his life greedy for gain. Again, all of these things, it doesn't mean the elder is perfect. Pride is is always going to creep in occasionally. We're sinners, right? All of us are sinners. Pride is going to creep in. And so we'll need to repent. Every now and then, even the most mature men in the church will lose their temper, and they'll need to repent. Every now and then, envious greed will, will find its way into our hearts before we have a chance to stamp it down. And again, repent. As you look for an elder, no, you're not looking for perfection, but this godly character should shine out. And when you're considering a man, these bad characteristics, greed, violence, being a drunkard, these should not be what comes to mind when you think of that person. If it is, then that man needs to mature and grow. 
Let's look at the positive qualities. So verse 7 again, an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. So first we have hospitable there. I always say this is the one that surprises me the most on the list. Hospitable. But it heads the list. It's first, right? So how can you know if a man is godly and mature? One of the things is, is he hospitable? Is he somebody that makes you feel welcome? Is he somebody that is willing to sacrifice in order to have others in his home? Is the elder hospitable? Next, is he a lover of good? This is a a compound word that's only used here, but it's pretty easy to guess what it means. Uh, It's the word love and the word good, just smashed together. And uh, you can guess what that means. He loves good things. He loves goodness. This is not a man who revels in wickedness, who loves the evil in the world, but this is someone who loves to see good things, who delights in doing good, who delights in the Father's goodness towards us. Jesus said, the good person out of the good treasury of his heart brings forth good. All of that, the same word for good. The good person out of the good treasury of his heart brings forth good. So an elder is to be somebody who loves good things, that doesn't rejoice in wickedness. Next, he's self-controlled. He's not someone that you think of as flying off the handle of being foolish or being undisciplined, being easily tempted. Instead, an elder is steady. He's got good control of himself. He's sensible and wise. He's prudent. The next two are upright and holy. These are are related, you can tell, right? Upright and holy. He's upright in the sense that he is righteous and just. Uh, This is speaking of the righteousness of his character. He's holy in the sense that he's devout or, or pious. He loves the Lord. And so he's walking in this uprightness and and holiness. You can tell when you look at this man that he loves the Lord. That he's grown in maturity. And finally, the last one, disciplined. This is another word for self-controlled. An elder is a man who who has mastery over himself. He's well-disciplined. He works hard. He doesn't give in to his whims. So, oh, oh no, I fell into that sin again. You know, it's somebody who is diligent, disciplined, self-controlled, steady, hospitable, a lover of good, sensible, upright, holy, and disciplined. You can see that this is a a, a well-rounded individual, these elders. And I think that Paul is saying to Titus, there are men like this in the churches. You need to find the men like this. The churches need to appoint them as elders and follow their leadership. You can see that this is a well-rounded individual, careful to walk in maturity in all areas of his life. No, not perfect, but somebody who has been shaped and molded by trials, somebody who's been shaped and molded by God's word, somebody who's been shaped and molded by God's grace into maturity. Let's press on so that we don't run out of time. We have three areas of blamelessness, family, character, And then our last one now is doctrine. Doctrine, look at verse nine. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So it says he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. And that word for trustworthy is the same word we saw earlier about the children. Faithful, dependable, trustworthy word. 
the scriptures are dependable. The scriptures that have been handed down to us from the apostles. Elders are to have a firm grasp on them. That is what's dependable. That is what's trustworthy. That's what's been handed down is God's word, God's teaching. And so just as these men have been taught, so they are to hold firmly on to these truths. Why? Because the church needs to be taught and because false teachers need to be rebuked. He says, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So positively give instruction, negatively rebuke those false teachers. So an elder is somebody who can handle the scriptures well enough so that he can boldly defend against false teachers, boldly defend against the wolves when they come into the church those who contradict the trustworthy word. This is what we saw when we looked at Acts 20 last week, right? The chief job description is for those elders was defend the flock, watch out for the wolves, be ready, be looking out for false doctrine. So you need to know the scriptures, have a firm grasp on them, not only to defend, but also because he needs to give instruction. So an elder is somebody who's expected to be giving instruction and sound doctrine. I believe this should be a regular part of his life that he's quick to shepherd, that he's always discipling individually, one-on-one, in counseling, in marriage counseling, in preaching, in teaching. An elder is somebody who's, who's instructing, giving sound doctrine. And for the sake of the congregation, there should never be a doubt in their minds that the elder is somebody who knows the scriptures and knows them well. Because the elders are the first line of defense against false teaching, and they're the first line of offense against immaturity, right? The first line of offense against ignorance. So they need to know the scriptures and know them well so they can defend and so they can teach and protect the church. So family, character, doctrine. Now some of you might be thinking, I'm not going to be an elder. What does this have to do with me? This sermon has had a lot of words and none of them apply to me. Well, not so fast, right? You know, first, if you're a young man, don't discount the fact that one day you might be an elder. And so these are things you should be working on right now. Your family, your character, your doctrine. But second, and more broadly, for those who don't aspire to be an elder, what has he just described to us? I believe he's just given us a picture of what does Christian maturity look like? He's saying, how do you find the faithful, mature men in the church to lead the church? Well, this is what they look like. And so what is he describing to us? He's describing maturity. These are things that all of us should be striving after. I believe that Paul has just helped Titus understand how to find the people who walk in the Spirit, who are full of wisdom. And so that matters for us, too. How do we know if we're growing in maturity? Well, you look at our family. Family life matters. You look at our character. You look at our doctrine. This is something that we should all chase after and strive. And so I'd like to turn the question towards you and say, where have you been displaying marks of immaturity? Have you been hot-headed recently? Have you been quick to lose your temper? Have you been arrogant? Quick to slip in 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 a conversation. Quick to slip in your own accomplishments so that others can give you glory. Have you been arrogant and boastful? Have you been neglecting your family so that your household is not well-ordered, well-managed? Have you been greedy for gain? Constantly wishing that your house was as big as your neighbor's or your car was as faultless as your neighbor's. 
where have you been displaying these marks of immaturity? Have you decided to leave the doctrines in the scriptures to the pastor? Not working hard to study and grow yourself. Saying, oh, that's the pastor's job. I don't need to be working towards that. Have you been a lover of evil? Rejoicing with the world as you partake in unwholesome activities. Have you been undisciplined? Have you been foolish? I believe that for any Christian, the qualifications given for the elders are marks of maturity that we should all look for in ourselves. So step away from immaturity. Press on to maturity. And I think they all feed into each other. You know, a young man might ask, where do I start? Which one of these is most important? You know, where do I start growing into maturity? And I think the honest answer that you have to say is all of them. You start with all of them, right? I mean, we've met Christians that maybe only have one of them. You know, many younger believers, they they focus only on knowledge at first. They forget to march forward in family maturity. They forget to march forward in their character. And so what do they become? They become know-it-alls that are, that are arrogant, that maybe know the doctrines, can quote to you, you know, such and such theologian, but they've got no character and they've neglected their family. They forgot to, to march forward in these other areas as well. Others focus only on their families. They make sure their families are as perfect as can be, whether that's through homeschooling or their family devotions or through the strictest discipline. To them, the family becomes the only center of maturity as they grow. But they forget to be working on their own black heart. They forget to be repenting and working on heart change, working on their character. They forget to be striving to grow in knowledge themselves. As I said, they they leave that to the pastors. The pastors can grow in knowledge. And so... Though their family is ordered, their character and their doctrine is disordered. Or finally, some focus only on their character. Yes, they're quick to repent, repent, they're quick to grow, quick to discipline themselves, but they neglected their families, and they've neglected the word of God. They neglect growing in knowledge. So maybe I'm belaboring this too long, but you can see, right? You can see that really this is a, a three-legged stool. That God le- godly maturity, growing in maturity, is growing in all of these areas, our family life, our character, our knowledge of God's word. As Christians, we're to be growing in all of them. If we only have grown in one or two of the legs, then we still have work to do. And really, we all have work to do in all three areas, right? Even the most mature among us, we all have work to do. But as for the elders... They must not be blameless in only one or two of these areas. They need to be blameless in their family and their character and their doctrine. They need to be mature, godly, well-rounded men ready to lead the church. Which brings us to one more application. Our last application before we close, and that's the congregational application. In an elder-led church, it's the congregation that's responsible for making sure that they identify the godly leaders and making sure that they help produce the godly leaders. It's God who produces godly leaders, but he uses the church, doesn't he? And I think that's how we all can work together. I believe that producing godly elders starts all the way back in children's ministry. As these young people are being trained to have these godly impulses, this kindness in their character after they become believers, learning scriptural truth from a young age. And a congregation is responsible to help nurture this in the young men in the church. Iron, sharpening iron, discipling each other, faithfully growing each other, spurring each other on to love and good deeds. This is a congregation's responsibility. We should all be working towards this maturity. The congregation is also responsible to help identify the elders. 
so a congregation shouldn't put forward a man whose family is a disaster. A congregation shouldn't put forward a man whose doctrine is false or who is untaught in the scriptures. A congregation shouldn't put forward a man whose character is severely flawed. Instead, as we celebrate the gospel of Christ, as we celebrate all of our own forgiveness, not claiming that any of us are perfect, understanding that every single one of us in the church, by definition, is somebody who has sinned beyond belief and unsavable were it not for the work of God in our life, the work of Christ on the cross to forgive us of our sins. Understanding that we need forgiveness. Coming with that understanding and then pausing to identify the godly leaders in a congregation. Who are these men? Identifying godly elders. And while we do, working towards those same marks of well-rounded maturity in ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we do pray. We do pray that you would bless us always with faithful, godly men to lead this church. We do give you great honor and glory for the fact that you have saved us and that none of us, none of us, could achieve anything like this maturity on our own. But we have been washed and cleansed by the blood of Christ. We've been forgiven. We've been changed, molded by trials, molded by your grace, molded by your word, so that we can grow into maturity. And so, Father, I pray that you would help all of us, help all of us be mature, in the sphere of our family life. Help us progress in maturity in the sphere of our character. Help us progress in maturity in the sphere of our doctrine, of our knowledge. Help us be a church that's full of people who are walking in godly love and maturity. And help us as we identify and appoint elders in this church body. In Jesus' name, amen.